So I was diagnosed out of the blue at age 33 with breast cancer and I didn't have a family history of breast cancer and it wasn't until that I was reading a magazine article about hereditary cancers and about genetic testing for BRCA1 and 2. And then they were talking about how people of certain um, ethnicities or groups are more likely to have a mutation and that included Ashkenazi Jewish people. And I was like, okay, I'm three for three here. But my healthcare team never told me that. So one of the most important things to know when you get a cancer diagnosis is how you're going to be treated. And learning about your cancer, learning about the things that make your cancer unique helps the doctors make the best decisions in order to give you the best medicine that is specifically targeted to the cancer that's in your body. And one of those things are hereditary or germline mutations. So these are mutations that come in your DNA you get one set of DNA from, or one half of your DNA from your mom, one half from your dad, and sometimes mutations can be passed down in families. And at a time of a cancer diagnosis, a lot of times that's the only time that a family will suddenly find out that there are these sneaky little things going on in their bodies that they have no control over that means they're more predisposed to a cancer diagnosis, to diabetes, to heart disease, to all kinds of different things. But understanding those mutations in your DNA not only helps the doctors know what medications to pick, but then you can also plan, uh, do family planning, you can inform your families. Um, there's all kinds of really important things about knowing what is uh, in your DNA. And so I'm super excited to have Sue Friedman here with us today, who is with FORCE, which uh, stands for Facing Our Risk of Cancer Empowered. Uh, an organization all about making sure people understand what's in their DNA and then know what to do with it. So, Sue, would you tell us, why did you found FORCE? Where did it come from? So, I was diagnosed out of the blue at age 33 with breast cancer, and I was very proactive with my health, but, you know, I didn't have a family history of breast cancer. And it wasn't until after I was diagnosed and actually, after I had my initial treatment, that I was reading a magazine article about hereditary cancers and about genetic testing for BRCA1 and 2. This was really many years ago, so kind of in the early days of precision medicine. And But it was in this magazine article, and they were talking about BRCA1 and 2 testing and how certain people are more likely to have an inherited mutation that can predispose them to cancer. And so I'm reading through these red flags, and one of them was young onset breast cancer. And I'm like, okay, that's me, 33 with breast cancer. And then I was talking about a link between other cancers, like ovarian cancer, and my paternal grandmother on my father's side had some kind of abdominal cancer. And they said it could be passed on from either side of the family, like you said, and nobody had ever asked me really about my father's side of the family and medical intake forms. But, you know, all of those things together. And then they were talking about how people of certain um, ethnicities or groups are more likely to have a mutation, and that included Ashkenazi Jewish people. And I was like, okay, I'm three for three here. But my healthcare team never told me that. Wow. Yeah. So I'm reading in a magazine article, and I said to them, I want this test. And they were like, sure, give us your arm. We'll pull the blood. We'll send it in. Well, they never actually sent it in. Awesome. Wait a minute. They never sent the blood in? They never sent the blood in. I know. Wow. And there was no genetic counseling. And again, back to this was the early days of genetic testing, but I also ended up having a recurrence soon after that. So I ended up at a cancer center for a second opinion. 
And I told them, I want this test. And they're like, okay, you have to have genetic counseling. And so I found out I was halfway through chemotherapy when I found out I had a BRCA2 mutation. But suddenly I had to make other decisions too because I had had a unilateral mastectomy for treatment. Wow. And suddenly I learned my other breast was at really high risk. And I I don't want to go through chemo and treatment again. And then, you know, they were talking about my ovarian cancer risk. And I didn't think I was done with, you know, having children, but I felt like I don't want to go through another diagnosis. So I had to make these really tough decisions like, do I end my fertility, take my ovaries out? And there really weren't resources about that. Was your medical team helpful in making those decisions? Well, they were, but because this was such early days in genetic testing, it was a new test, so they didn't have a lot of long-term outcomes. So they'd say, well, we think this will lower your risk for ovarian cancer, which makes sense. We sure. think removing your other breast is a good idea, but we don't know. We don't have long-term outcomes yet. So, you know, I had to kind of make those decisions in a vacuum, at least an evidence vacuum. And there were a lot of other people that I met who had breast cancer and they were support services and support groups, but most of them weren't making those decisions with regard to genetic testing and what to do with that risk. And so I really felt the need. And so it was out of my own need that I started Force. And I, you know, I started as a lark. I mean, I didn't even have a computer when I was diagnosed. And so soon after treatment, I did take out my ovaries. I was newly postmenopausal at 35. So I spent a lot of nights awake with insomnia. And I'd be on these message boards talking to other survivors and realized I started meeting these other people with mutations. And some of them didn't have cancer and some of them did, and they really had nowhere to go. So that's kind of why I started Forest 24 years ago to give us all a place to go. And 24 years. 24 wow. years. And I, it just grew and there was such a need. And so about five years into running Forest, I actually made the very difficult decision to give up my veterinary career to do it full time because there were a lot of great vets out there, but there was really only one organization providing resources specifically for that community. And I think I read recently that Force was behind the term pre-viver. We were. And so one of the members of our community, and she actually happened to be a member of our board of directors, you know, she said, I need a label. What am I? I don't have cancer, but I know cancer. I lost my mom to cancer at a young age. I've lost my breast to cancer risk. I lost my ovaries to cancer risk, but I don't have cancer. It really started this. She said, I'm not one for labels, but I need a label for this. And what I realized then too was that there was this whole group of stakeholders that weren't part of the conversation. And before I started Force, I'd go to support groups and I'd see some of these pre-vivers go and they were apologetic. Like, I know I don't belong here. I'm sorry, I don't have cancer. They were always apologizing. And sometimes they weren't welcomed as stakeholders. Um, so it was really for that population that Force became a real home. And so we kind of did a search of terms and we came up with Previvor for survivor of a predisposition to cancer. Not everybody loves the term, which is fine. The idea was though, to give a voice sure. to a community that didn't feel they had one. Sure. Now, when you look at the people who have been diagnosed with breast cancer, is hereditary breast cancer something that makes up a lot of the reason for a diagnosis or is that a small percentage still? Well, it's, you know, it's about, 10% okay. roughly, um, and many people don't know that they have a mutation, but it can affect treatment decisions. It can affect prevention um, options, and it can affect your family members. And it's not just breast cancer, it's other cancers as well. So knowing that information can be really important to medical decision making. It's not like it's the majority of people with cancer, but when you look across you know, the spectrum of people who have been diagnosed with breast cancer and other cancers, these are often families that have a disproportionate cancer burden. There are relatives, there's, you know, siblings, there's, you know, parents, there's children and cousins. And, you know, and so the, the burden within some of these families is really, really high. 
Sure, because once you find one incident of hereditary cancer, everybody starts getting tested. And then I know in my particular family, when I was diagnosed with ATM, which not it's not BRCA, it's, right. it's a different lower moderate risk for breast cancer, but um, I'm one of six, so one of my sisters is positive, my mother, uh, my uncle, several of my cousins. Do you find that when people find out that their cancer was probably caused by hereditary, like their genes, right? They have no yeah. control over that. Do you find that helps people realize it's not their fault? You know, it's a mixed bag. Hmm. I know for me, it was a little bit of an aha, but not everybody gets that answer. Not sure. every 33 year old with breast cancer gets that. So for them, they don't get that, you know, like being able to know. But there's also, there can be a layer of guilt. There can be a layer of, you know, family dynamics. And sometimes sure. the family dynamics that were already at play get heightened because of it. So it's right. Um, so let's just talk about how you find out you have a genetic mutation. Um, you mentioned genetic counselors, so I assume a doctor has to order a test. Yes, that's true. And then what happens? Well, you know, there are a lot of different entrees into okay. finding out that information. And so, you know, one thing we're seeing more and more of is that people who are diagnosed with cancer, and especially if they're diagnosed with in the breast cancer realm, metastatic breast cancer, they may get tumor testing and the tumor testing may suggest that there's a mutation. Same, we see that with prostate cancer as sure. well. Um, so that's one way to, oh, okay, now I may have an inherited mutation and I should get genetic testing. Um, there are also, I mean, we recommend people talk to an expert in genetics because the test, ordering the test is complicated. It's not just one test anymore. And as you can, you know, you were talking about, it's not just BRCA1 and 2 right. anymore. And there's, you know, at least, you know, 20 plus genes that have all been identified and associated with breast cancer and then other genes associated with colorectal cancer. And so, you know, they now do panel testing. And so being able to order the right test and appropriately, um, you know, interpret the results, sure. you want some expertise. So we so usually- So is that a geneticist? Are you seeing a geneticist? Or a genetic counselor, but okay. also there are oncologists who are highly trained in genetics. So that, you know, it doesn't have to necessarily be a gen There are genetic nurses now there. I mean, really there's been an expansion of the amount of people who are able to provide that information up front. And then after someone gets a test result, also telling them what it means for themselves, what it means for their family, who else in their family should now get that information. Um, and really also, you know, the other thing, and this is the group we worry about, are there may be people who test negative, but there may be something still going on in that family. So there may be clinical trials that they can join to look for other additional genes, or there may be further testing that, you know, would be appropriate for them. So we want to make sure that just because someone gets a negative test doesn't mean that they're, you know, they're not seeing a genetics expert after that test result. Is. So I know there's been a whole lot of different genetic type things in the news, genealogy things, right? 23andMe. Yes. Are those as reliable or as helpful as a test that is ordered by a doctor? So the short answer to that is no. Um, some of the tests, so like the 23andMe test, it looks for some of the more common mutations found in people of Ashkenazi Jewish descent. They're, they, I think, are now reporting out some colorectal cancer mutations, but they're not, they're testing just a small amount, even in BRCA1 and 2, and they're not looking for these other genes like ATM and PALB2 and CHECK2 and, you know, these other genes that can have mutations. Right. So I know that sometimes when you have genetic testing, you see on the report a VUS, which yes. is Variant of Unknown Significance. Right. What the heck do you do with that? Again, this is one of the reasons why we tell people, you know, go see a genetics expert. Unfortunately, we've seen healthcare professionals who didn't have training in genetics report those as mutations to people. So, you know, a variant of uncertain or unknown significance or VUS, it's a frustrating result because genetic testing most of the time, especially for BRCA1 and 2, 
Some of these newer genes a little less. So, you know, most of the time it will be a yes, you have a mutation or no, you don't. But once in a while you get this inconclusive test result. We haven't tested enough people. We don't know. It could be a difference, a gene change. That's the difference between two functioning genes, but they function just a little differently, but they still work versus you have a mutation causing cancer. And there's really a need for expertise in those situations because then from there, the best recommendations they make are based on your family history and your personal medical history. And so you really need someone who has that expertise and training to look at that and see which cancers are related. So important to have an expert in your corner to help explain even when you're thinking about a test, should you get the test? How do you interpret the test? Yeah. But then you have the test and it says there's some genetic mutation. You have some predisposition towards cancer. That doesn't mean that you're going to get that cancer, right? It, it, it doesn't, but your risk may be very high and it's really important. So the other thing that expanded panel testing has done for us is found all these genes and they all have different risks. So they used to be that even BRCA1 and 2 were kind of lumped together, but the risks are a little different for the different cancers. So BRCA1, you're more likely to have a varying cancer than BRCA2. BRCA2, you're a little more likely to get pancreatic cancer than BRCA1. So they all are different. And the same is true for some of these other genes like PALB2 and ATM. But fortunately, there are some guideline panels that look through the evidence every year and update those guidelines based on the gene. So it's really important too, and this is another reason to see an expert, to make sure that they recognize the gene you have may be different than you know BRCA1 or 2, and that they may come with a different set of guidelines and recommendations. And so if there's a person who is considering genetic testing, has had genetic testing, or is has something that's going on in the family, what can FORCE do for that particular person? match people by gene mutation, by their cancer diagnosis, their stage, um, their age if we can, and then geographically we really try and match people as best as we can to someone who's had a similar situation so that they can talk to a peer who's been through it and then we connect them to personalized Guide, guidelines and information, and even now clinical trials. So we have clinical trials that are embedded to our website based on the gene that someone has, because now there are clinical trials that are open to people with PALB2 or ATM, um, or you know people with, not to bring up a different topic, but people who don't have inherited mutations, but they have acquired or somatic mutations um, that they found from tumor testing or from, you know, some of the biomarker testing, looking at tumors, because we know that, you know, matching people to these types of specific clinical trials, they're really looking for that needle in the haystack person, that sub, you know, group of the larger group. Such a labor of love to be it, able to give people personal. that information. It, it's yeah, and gratifying too. It really is incredible to be able to, and I'm sure you know this, to be able to meet someone who is facing a challenge and be able to provide them with resources that can help them. I mean, what's better than that?